So, very glad to be with you today, friends. We are going to uh, work on a message on what does it mean to trust God. I think that my outline is going to be on the screen behind me, but if it's not, I'll just try to be clear about what I'm saying, and hopefully you'll, you'll be with me anyway. So, I want to read a single verse, uh, two verses rather, out of Hebrews 11, and then pray for us. The writer of Hebrews says in 11, verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and then verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Let me pray for us, please, friends. Father, we bless you for this good day, for this Lord's Day. Thank you for a chance to gather as people who believe and think about your book and think about you and pursue your will in our lives. So will you help us, please, by your Holy Spirit? May we have your clarity. May we have your motivation. May we have your enabling ability. Uh, let us be people who honor you by listening to your word and then going out and adjusting our lives. Father, we commit ourselves to you. We're grateful for your love and kindness to us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. When our boys were small, we lived in an apartment building in Anchorage, Alaska. And on that building, there was a ledge that was a, maybe a couple feet wide, and it was about 10 feet in the air. Now, these boys are preschool and barely into grade school, and I used to boost them up on that ledge about 10 feet up, and then I would step back a ways, and I would say, now jump to me. And uh, the first few times I put them on the ledge, they wouldn't jump, and I had to get them down off the ledge. But eventually they got to where they would jump to me. And uh, we would play a game of how far back would Dad go and then still be willing to jump. Now, friends, those boys today are 37 and 34, and there's no way I could catch them. And uh, that's a game for little children. But they trusted me enough that they would eventually start jumping. And we got to a place where they would jump quite a distance, and it would be a challenge for dad to catch them and mom never liked this game that we played uh, but we had a great time with it they would only jump when they trusted me it would be foolish to jump off a 10-foot ledge when you're five years old without dad there ready to catch you I told you that story to ask you this question do you trust your Heavenly Father have you found him to be trustworthy? Would you jump off a ledge to God? We're going to talk today about faith and about the reality of God calling us to trust him and to be people who say, Lord, I find you trustworthy. I'm not going to make any demands of you. I'm not going to define how you have to take care of my life. But I find you trustworthy and I'm willing to cast myself on you. So I want to begin by saying that we are people who live in an unfriendly universe and in a fallen world. We live in an extremely difficult place. You only have to be about two years old to come to that conclusion. That we live in a very difficult place. According to the Christian worldview, here's why. Because Satan fell, he rose up and said, I want to be God, and he was cast out of heaven with about one-third of the, of the angels who became demons. And because Adam and Eve and mankind fell, and because sin resulted, and because of all of that, the universe became unfriendly. It's not a happy place to live. The world became fallen. And so now we experience in this world unkindness and hatred and disease and sin and alienation and death and anxiety and terrorism and cancer and on and on and on. You could get on USA Today, which I did on my phone this morning, and flip through some of the top stories, some of the top, top headlines, and the basic message, the basic conclusion is, we live in a fallen world. Somewhere in the south, southeast, yesterday, a man went to visit his neighbor at 9.19 in the morning, and as he walked up to his neighbor's porch, he encountered a severed head on the neighbor's porch. It's on USA Today this morning. Friends, that's what I would call an unfriendly universe. That's what I would call a fallen world. And while I've never experienced that, and I never hope to experience that, and I feel extremely mad, sad for the person who was decapitated, I will say it's part of the evidence that we live in a fallen world. Second reality is we are, we are dependent people. 
We are not independent, self-sufficient people. We need help. We can't go without air for more than five minutes. We can't go without water. We need food. We need the pH level of our blood to be in a certain range or we'll die. We need the temperature to be within a certain range or we'll either roast or we'll freeze. We can't make life work by ourselves. We are simply not people who have the power to make life work. We come into the world helpless. If someone doesn't help a baby, they will die. And we age until we are helpless. If someone doesn't feed us, we will die. That's the kind of people that we are. We live in a fallen world. We are dependent people. We do not have the ability to make life work for ourselves. Therefore, we need to trust someone, small s, or something, small s, or someone, capital S. That's your three choices. So because we're living in a fallen world, we need to put our dependence on someone. We need to have either a friend, or a parent, or a sugar daddy, or a politician. We need someone that we can cast ourselves on and say, this person will help me. Or we need something, like a great skill, or money, or reputation, or an idol. I was in a Caribbean country last year, came into a home, started to share Christ. The woman stopped me, wanted to be in argument because underneath her television was an idol. And this idol, she said, was taking care of her life. She was trusting something to take care of her life. Now her trust was bitterly misplaced, friends, bitterly, obviously. But she was trusting that thing. Or you could trust someone, capital S, the God of the universe. This being with amazing ability, with complete knowledge, and with unbelievable compassion. Ability, knowledge, and compassion. That's God's resume. We could go into the three parts of that if, if we had time. But I'm saying that we need to be people who say, listen, I understand who God is. I'm willing to trust him. Hebrews 11, 1 again, please. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things that are unseen. It is a settled, certain conviction that God will do what he said he would do. It is not hope so. It is not hope so. It is certainty despite the fact that we haven't seen it. When I worked for the Park Service in Yellowstone Park about four decades ago, I was riding on a backcountry trail on a horse. My friend was behind me on a horse. We were checking camping permits, and we came out of the woods into a meadow up to a canyon with a river in the bottom and a big footbridge across it. We rode up to the end, edge of it. My friend said to me, Dave, do you trust that bridge? I said, yeah, it looks good. Good decking, big cables holding it, cables anchored into the rock. Looks like a good bridge. He said, would you ride a thousand pound horse across it? Okay, that's another question. When you're standing on the bank, you're expressing opinion. When you're standing on the bridge, you're expressing faith. You're putting your trust in it. It's a hundred foot long bridge. It's a hundred foot down to the water. Once you get out in the middle of it, friends, the bridge is all you've got. Now, friends, I didn't ride a horse across it. I led the horse across it because I didn't want to be sitting up that high in case we had a rodeo. But we did walk across that bridge. We put our trust in it. God is saying, I want you to be people who get off the bank and put your trust in me. I want you to be people who believe in the unseen. That's why we are called believers. We are not called seers. We believe a bunch of stuff we've never seen. I believe God. I've never seen him. I believe Jesus paid for my sins on the cross. I was not there. I believe Jesus was raised from the dead. I didn't see him come out of the grave. I believe Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for me right now. Have never seen that. I believe the Holy Spirit enables us to live the life we should. Never physically seen it. I could go on and on and on and on and on about the stuff I believe. Stuff that you believe that you have never seen. I have a brother who sadly enough is an unbeliever. He's a year and a half younger than me. 
He doesn't believe in the existence of God. He is an adamant atheist. And there are probably 500 things that I believe that I haven't seen that he doesn't believe that he hasn't seen. I am a believer. And if you put your hope in Christ, you are also a believer. You believe in stuff you haven't seen. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. If you don't trust God, it's not difficult to please him. It's impossible to please him. It's a core issue with God. Friends, uh, we raised three children in the kindness of God. They're doing well today. They're following God. But they exasperated the daylights out of us at many times in the course of their upbringing. I came home twice to fire trucks at my house. Once for the first boy, once for the second boy. Uh, they exasperated us in many ways. One time my daughter tried to choke our middle son. I saved his life. Literally, I'm in a prayer circle with some deacons in the basement of a church, and I hear a scuffle going on, and I turn around, and our daughter has our son in a chokehold. She's going to kill him. And I go over, I save my son's life, and I come back and finish the prayer circle. Our kids did plenty to exasperate us. But the thing that I hated the most is when they didn't trust us. When we were doing something or saying something or preventing something for their good and they did not trust us, I hated that. God hates it when we don't trust him. He doesn't hate us. He loves us. But he hates it when we don't trust him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Here's the two things. Foundationally, you must believe. Number one, he exists. And number two, he rewards people who seek him. As Asaph said in Psalm 73, the nearness of God is my good. As David said in Psalm 27, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. The nearness of God is my good. God wants me to believe he exists and believe that he rewards me if I pursue him. Two foundational things. So I want to I finish this message by talking about three people who demonstrated remarkable faith in God. Centurion soldier, a bleeding woman, and a man named Abraham. The first one is found in Luke chapter 7, verses 2 to 10. I want to read it to you, please. So a centurion was a man who commanded 100 soldiers, centurion. And he worked for the Roman government. Uh, he was in their military, and he was part of the occupying force of Rome in the Holy Land. This particular man was pretty unique because he wasn't your average soldier, and you'll see that in a moment. So, a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come, that is, asking Jesus to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly employed him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. <coughs> this is pretty remarkable, friends. Here's a, here's a soldier a Roman commander who loves Israel and who spent his own money to build a synagogue for the people of that town. Pretty unusual occupying soldier in this case. So Jesus started on his way with them and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself further for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another one, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. This centurion invested trust in Jesus. He said to Jesus, you don't have to come all the way here. I believe you could do this from where you are. This centurion understand healing was about authority. And he said, I believe Jesus has that. Healing is about ability. And I believe Jesus has that. Healing is not about geography. You don't have to be here present with this slave of mine, Jesus, to heal him. That's clear to me. And so just say the word, 
and he will be healed the same as when I say the word, my slave runs and does something. Now, friends, here to me is the stunning verse of what I just read to you, verse 9. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Here is a centurion who caused the God of the universe to marvel. That's stunning to me. What would you have to do to cause God to marvel? How much would you have to trust God to cause the God of the universe to say, that's marvelous. That's amazing. That's the way this man trusted God, and he caused Jesus to marvel. What would I have to do for Jesus to say, Dave, that is marvelous faith. You have trusted me extremely well. Second person I want to look at is over one chapter. It's Luke 8, 43 to 48. This is a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. Let me read you the story. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him, that is behind Jesus, and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, Who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding in and pressing in on you. Basically, Peter said, Hey, 140 people have touched you in the last couple minutes. What are you talking about? That just doesn't make any sense. Everybody's been touching you. What are you talking about? But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that the power had gone out from me. Jesus knew somebody came up and intentionally touched me and I felt power go out of me that was taken into that person. I know that someone touched me. And when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling, she fell down before Jesus and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now think about this woman for a moment, please. She has 12 years of unabated bleeding. Most scholars think she was having her period 24-7 uh, for 12 years. She was going to doctors, trying to get healed. She had probably been to every man manner of witch doctor. She had probably tried every manner of potion. She had exhausted herself and her wealth trying to be healed. Every day she was tired. Every day she was ceremonially unclean. On no day could she go to the temple. Anybody who touched her was unclean. She spent her entire life exhausted, her entire life washing, clothing, and bedding. She was in despair. Can you imagine having a migraine for 12 years? Can you imagine having a toothache for 12 years unabated? This woman was bleeding for 12 years unab unabated. She was in horrible condition. And what is her stance toward Jesus? Let me tell you, first of all, what her stance is not. Her stance is not, what could it hurt? That's not what she's thinking. Her stance is not, I've tried a bunch of stuff, I'll give it a shot. Her stance is not, I doubt it, but hey, I'm here, I might as well do it. That's not what's going on in her heart and mind. What's going on in her heart and mind is, I will fight my way through this crowd and touch him no matter what. <coughs> That's the stance in her heart. I will touch Jesus. Because there was in her heart a belief that if I do, I will be healed. She believed something she had not yet seen. She had a settled conviction about something that had not yet happened. She was a woman of faith. She trusted Jesus and she fought her way through and touched him and said I, I don't care what it takes now listen friends she's got to be weak there's a big crowd they're all jostling around to get near Jesus but she said I don't care what it takes I will get there and touch him and she did and she was healed in response to her faith and when Jesus asked who had touched him she came forward and came clean in an attitude of worship came forward, came clean in an attitude of worship, and Jesus said, go your way, sister. 
Your faith has made you well. Go your way, my daughter. You are a person who has been healed because you have trusted me. She was not a person with a it couldn't hurt attitude. She was a person with I must do this because I will be healed. Twelve years and she finally sees her opportunity. She fights her way forward. Last person I want to ask you to consider is this well-known Old Testament saint named Abraham. I want to ask you to think about Abraham and I'm going to read a single verse about him. But before I do that, I want to ask you to think about what he trusted God for. He trusted God to leave his hometown and go to a country that he didn't know what the country was. You know, I mean, it's similar to, you know, me having a dream in the night. God says, Dave, rent a U-Haul tomorrow, pack all your stuff, start driving northwest. Where? Just start driving northwest, I'll make it clear. That's what Abraham did, friends. Rented a U-Haul and started driving due west. No idea where he was going. Hebrews says he lived in the, in the land of Israel as a sojourner. He didn't own any land there. It's the promised land, but the only land he owned was the cemetery where he buried his wife. So ironic, friends. So spiritually amazing that he goes to the promised land, and the only thing he owns there is a grave. And the message is, even though he traveled here to the promised land, it wasn't his final home. He was still a sojourner here. He wasn't going to live in Israel truly until the new heaven and the new earth. But he trusted God for that. He said, I'm willing to do that. He looked at the night sky and God said to him, you will have this many descendants. He looks up at the night sky, sees the stars and said, I believe that. I trust you, God. I believe that. Then in Genesis 22, he takes his son, his only son, the boy who was born after his 90th birthday and after his wife's 90th birthday, and he raises the knife to kill him. And the scripture said he believed God was going to raise the boy from the dead. He knew that this was the boy. He knew this boy had to have children so there could be more children, so there could be as many Hebrew people as the night stars. And he, he was willing to kill him because he said, I believe God's going to raise him from the dead. He believed God for that. He believed God for a whole lot more. And so Paul says of, of Abraham in Galatians 3, 9, So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, comma, the believer. Abraham has a nickname. The believer. Oh my goodness, I wish that were my nickname. What a stunning nickname. This book for all eternity will exist, and for all eternity we'll know Abraham as the believer he trusted God so much and so continually for such big things that Paul gave him a nickname the believer here was a man who said I believe in God I believe in things that don't yet exist I am a person who believes in the unseen I will order my entire life based on stuff I have never seen you know here, here's a couple ordering their life moving to Thailand and learning the Thai language based on stuff they have never seen. They are believers. God is calling us to be people who are also believers. Core idea, friends, uh, w when I trust God, I both please Him and I gain His help. I both please Him and I gain His help. What do I need to trust Him for? Two things. First thing I need to trust Him for is forgiveness and eternal life. The Bible's message simply that I am a person with a sin problem, that I have violated the standards of God, I've violated the character of God, I've done things that are evil, and every honest person has to say, I have done stuff that I am ashamed of. Those are the things that I have violated God's character with. I have a sin problem, it separates me from a perfect holy God, I cannot perfect personally fix it, it's beyond my ability, I don't care if I give money to an orphanage, if I get baptized, if I crawl on my knees to a mountain shrine until my tendons hang out of my knees. I can't do anything to fix it. That's the bad news. The good news is Jesus did something about it, which is simply went on the cross, paid for my sin. Friends, there was a line of about uh, 15 billion people waiting to be crucified for their own sins. And when I got to the front of that line of 15 billion people to go up on the cross, Jesus said, Dave, I want you to stand over here. 
I'm going to go up and die in your place. I will pay for your sins. He was my substitute. He went instead of me. I never went up. I don't have to go up. He died in my place. And then God says, I'm calling you to make one simple decision. Put your trust 100% in Jesus for forgiveness. And if you do that, I will give you eternal life. I will give you the indwelling Holy Spirit. I will give you forgiveness. I will give you something meaningful to do with your life. I will give you joy. I will give you strength. I will give you help. I will walk with you every day of your life. If you will make this simple decision, put your trust in Jesus alone for forgiveness. And if you haven't done that, God is saying, would you do it today? What is preventing you from doing it today? That's the foundational thing he wants us to trust him for. Here's the second thing he wants each one of us to trust him for. The second thing is fill in the blank. What is it in your life today that God wants you to fill in the blank? God, I will trust you for relationship with this person or for finances or for health or for strength or for direction or for encouragement or for forgiveness. What is it in your heart and life today in which God is saying, fill in the blank? I don't know what it is. I know what it is for me. I don't know what it is for you. He wants us to trust him for forgiveness, for salvation, and then he wants us to be people who fill in the blank and say, Father, I will trust you for whatever else you want me to trust you for. Friends, let, let me say the core idea one more time. When I trust God, I both please him and I gain his help. This is not a hope-so approach to God. This is a settled, certain conviction that things will happen that we have not seen. We are people who call believers. We are people who have the opportunity to, to amaze the God of the universe by what we trust him for. We are people who have the chance to imitate Abraham, comma, the believer. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the lives of these three people. Thank you for the ways that they trusted you. I'm praying for us, Father, that we would trust you. If there's a person here who's never trusted Christ, I pray you draw them to yourself today, at this moment, that they would make that decision. For whatever's going on in our individual lives that is tearing us up, let us be people who bring it to you, who trust you, who fight our way through the crowd, who touch Jesus, who say, I must, I must, I must get to Jesus. We rest ourselves with you in the Savior's name. Amen.